Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 27th Annual Animal Law Conference. We're so glad that you enjoyed us. I can't believe the crowd size. This is just awesome. And I'm Steve Wells. I am the Executive Director of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And with me is Pam Frosch, who is the Founder and Associate Dean of the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark. And we want to thank all of you for being here, and welcome to beautiful Portland, Oregon. We are so happy to be uh, hosting this event with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and you are in for a treat because we have three days of 40 amazing speakers from around the world, and it's gonna be a great weekend. It is, and we wanna thank our sponsor for the event, uh, our platinum sponsor, that is the Brooks Institute for Animal Law and Policy, and I think we have some folks from there here tonight uh, who are the platinum sponsor for the entire event. And they also are specifically sponsoring this evening's reception, so please, let's give them a really warm round of applause. The conference theme this year is an interesting one. Every year we uh, try and have a specific focus. And this year it's gonna be on the legal status of animals, which uh, as most of you probably know, uh, animals are considered property by and large in the law. And that really is one of the fundamental, pro fundamental problems for protecting animals under the law. So we're gonna be looking at and hearing about ways to challenge that status um, and what's been done so far and so forth. And we also know that the field of animal law has really changed a lot since Steve and I first got involved, which was a long time ago. And back when we started, people were really coming to these conferences and coming into our classes and saying, why? Why does there have to be animal law? Why does there have to be protection? Why do there have to be protections for animals? And now the field has evolved and advocates and students are so much savvier and they are coming into our classes and into our conferences and they're saying, how do we protect animals? How do we change their status? And that's what we're really gonna be focusing on in this conference for this weekend. Yeah, and it is, it's sometimes easy to forget how much progress has been made in the 25-ish years that uh, Pam and I have been seen. Um, and even longer, we have the mother of animal law, Joyce Tischler, uh, here, who's, uh, who is uh, the founder of the Animal Legal Defense Fund and one of the true pioneers in this field. Um, but there has been a lot of change. And of course, we hear about uh, major cases and legislation that passes and so forth. But even on the issue of animal status under the law, we've seen incremental changes that are moving the needle. Um, and that's really important. And I'm, I'm really happy that this conference is gonna be focused on the future and how we move that needle even farther. I'm, I'm particularly particularly interested tomorrow in the, uh, there's a civil litigation panel and as well as a criminal justice panel, and both of those areas have opportunities and really interested to hear what they have to say. We have some really great panels. We're gonna be looking at the emotional lives and the social lives of animals. We're gonna be looking at the science and the ethics that underlie our efforts to chain an change animal status in the law. And we're also gonna be looking at how other countries are addressing animal status in their legal systems. It's amazing what's happening internationally. Just in the last few weeks, there have been animal law conferences in Denmark, Sasha Lukasen is here who did that, um, in Canada, in China, and in the UK. And our keynote tomorrow is Professor Manisha Decca, who's going to be looking at the advances she and others in Canada have helped achieve for animals. So, so we're going to be learning a lot from a lot of different experts. Yeah, the international uh, law angle is really interesting because just seeing how the status of animals is treated differently and how much progress has been made, sometimes far beyond the US uh, in terms of the legal status of animals will be really interesting. And then um, on Sunday, I have to admit, one panel that I'm really looking forward to is the one on uh, robots, which of course is part of an animal law curriculum. Um, but I find it fascinating and also kind of alarming that there is robust discussion about our ethical and legal obligations to potential sentient life that we may create through artificial intelligence and robotics um, when I think it's safe to say we're doing a really poor job of our ethical and legal obligations to the already existing sentient beings with whom we share this planet. Mm -hmm. 
And other panels we're going to be looking at litigation, clinics, climate change, ethics. And of course, we really look forward to all of the questions that you're going to bring in, be bringing to these panels. We've also tried to build in some time because one of the great benefits of this experience for you is that we want you to connect with each other, we want you to talk to each other, we want you to think about future collaborations because the animals need all of you and together we can do so much more than we can individually. So please take advantage of this opportunity to connect with your colleagues. For sure, this is a great ne networking event. Um, well, bringing back to tonight, I'm really excited about our keynote speaker tonight, uh, who is one of the most powerful members in Congress and a great friend to animals, and as well has a lengthy history with Lewis and Clark Law School. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Pam uh, so we can move, move the program forward. Um, but I do wanna, I wanna reemphasize, like really um, so many good things have gotten started at this conference and at Lewis and Clark as well uh, for animals. So collaborations and great ideas. So really attend the panels, dig in, share, network with it, and who knows what will be created that we'll be talking about two, three, five years from now. So thanks for joining us. Yes. And at this time, I'm very pleased to ask our Dean of Lewis and Clark Law School, Dean Jennifer Johnson, to join me up here. And she will be introducing our keynote. And just to give you a little bit of background about Jennifer, she has a very long and impressive resume, so we can't talk about everything. But she graduated from Yale Law School, and she clerked for Judge Goodwin of the Ninth Circuit. She was in private practice for a few years, where she practiced business law. Um, and then she joined the faculty at Lewis and Clark in 1980. She's received um, several awards for her teaching and her scholarship, and she's been named the Jeffrey Bain Faculty Scholar and, uh, and also the Erskine Wood Senior Professor of Law in 2011, and she became Dean of the Law School in 2014. But on a more personal note, it's always a pleasure for me to introduce Dean Johnson because she's been a terrific uh, supporter and advocate for the Animal Law Program. And I'm very pleased to welcome her here so that she can welcome all of you to the entire Lewis and Clark Law School family. Thank you. As, as Pam said, I'm Jennifer Johnson. I'm the Dean of Lewis and Clark, and I'm delighted to welcome you also to this 27th anniversary of the Animal Law Conference. Um, as a professor and now Dean and at my career at Lewis and Clark over 30 years, I've had a uh, front row seat to witness the uh, huge growth in our Animal Law Program. And I'm very proud of our Center for Animal Law Studies and <laughs> our Associate Dean, Pam. And I, I, there's, we actually have our Associate Dean Pam Frosch and our executive director Pam Hart. So we have the Pams. Um, but what I wanted to say about both of the Pams in terms of international, they both just returned from China in an animal law conference, which is great unto itself. But even better, they returned with seven golden retrievers <laughs> that they rescued from China. So. And this is the second such rescue that Pam Frosch has been involved with in bringing golden retrievers back from China. So thank you, Pam. I want to acknowledge that at Lewis and Clark Law School, it was our students who first started our Animal Law program. They came to the faculty 25 years ago and said they had this crazy idea to produce a law journal devoted to animal law a field that none of us had ever heard of. But with the help of now Lewis and Clark Professor of Practice, Joyce Tischler, who then was at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, they persevered and we've celebrated the 25th anniversary, 25th anniversary of our Animal Law Journal and we're very, very proud of that and our students. Many of them are here tonight um, and I'd hope you join me in giving a hand to our law students without whom Lewis and Clark's law program just would not exist. So a hand for our students.
So again, the work all of you do is so important. There's actually hope for the future. There's hope for our world where animals are all treated well. Um, I encourage you to take advantage of all of the events and activities and networking opportunities that are here for you today and tomorrow and Sunday. So now I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Congressman Blumenauer is a double alum of Lewis and Clark. He received his bachelor's from the college in 1970 and his JD from the law school in 1976. Earl has devoted his entire career to public service. Through his years in the Oregon Legislature, the Multnomah County Commission, and the Portland City Council, he developed a national reputation for advocacy for public transportation, land use planning and protection of the environment, and for school funding. Now you'll know that Earl's signature lapel pin is a bicycle, and if you ask him really nicely by email, you might actually be able to get one of his coveted bicycles for, for your lapel. Animal protection has also been a priority for the congressman throughout his more, more than 20 years in Congress. He's focused his efforts on protecting wild and domestic animals alike, as well as the habitats of threatened and endangered species. As co-chair of the Congressional Animal Protection Caucus, Congressman Blumenauer has been a leader in efforts to crack down on animal cruelty and abuse, protect imperiled species, defend farm animals, and require responsible research and testing. He has sponsored or co-sponsored over a dozen bills that will directly improve the lives of animals around the world. Now, I'm willing to bet, Earl, that if we had an animal up program, when you were in law school, you would have been one of our star students. Now, I have a little bit of pull at the law school, not a lot, but a, a little bit. So, you know, if you're interested in coming back to get an LLM in animal law, for, for you non-lawyers, an LLM is a degree you can get after you've already become an attorney, which the congressman has. But you could come back, and I might be able to help you. I, I know the admissions dean. If you would like to come and get an LLM. Um, in the meantime, we appreciate all the work you're doing in Congress. So please join me with a warm welcome for Congressman Earl Blumenauer. All right, you don't have to email me. I have some bike pads. Don't all rush at once. Let me talk for a minute. Thank you, Dean. Something hit the floor. It wasn't me. But know that there's an electronic device there for somebody uh, who can use it. It is really a, a great honor for me to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, I am uh, truly inspired as I look at the program here and think of the evolution of this program over the course of the last 27 years. I've been pleased to join you on several occasions. Uh, I've been pleased to be able to share some of my rambling thoughts in the uh, law journal, uh, the Animal Law Journal, uh, talking about uh, some of our progress, particularly in Congress, in terms of uh, dealing with animal welfare. Um, and watch what's happening around the country. Um, I think when I was in law school, there may be a few uh, classes here and there scattered around the country that focus on animal law. Now we see programs in Ivy League, the Big Ten, and of course right here in the Pacific Northwest with Lewis and Clark, one of the first and arguably I may be a little biased, but uh, one of the very best. I'm proud of, of what has happened here, the interaction with the students and faculty, uh, and of course the journal. Um, Things are happening in this space politically, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That's kind of what I do for a living. Um, and you may have noticed that there's a little bit of contention in our nation's capital. <laughs> Things are really screwed up. Uh, 
Uh, I, 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 no small measure of amusement watching some of my colleagues rush the secure room um, demanding admittance when half of them were members of committees that were allowed to walk in. Uh, what? Uh, as I find myself and my colleagues saying, you can't make this up. I mean, if this, if this were a reality TV show that we had uh, pitched to the networks five years ago, nobody would have believed what is going on. But one of the areas where there is actually bipartisan progress is dealing with animal welfare. I am pleased to co-chair the Animal uh, Protection Caucus. This week, we passed the PACT Act to strengthen existing protections. for animals against torture. I was a part of the legislation that made it illegal uh, to send uh, those crush videos across state lines. But it wasn't illegal to produce them no longer. Uh, this bill is moving forward, and I'm really pleased that we had overwhelming bipartisan support to move it forward. Uh, it reflects sort of the ongoing battle we've got to increase the penalties against abusers. Part of the challenge we've had uh, for the 23 years that I've been working on this is for people to take them seriously and attach a felony designation. For too long, we had things on the books that were misdemeanors, and overburdened uh, local prosecutors just wouldn't take care, wouldn't pick them up and move with them. We've been fighting that battle for years. Um, we are, uh, we've, uh, we have legislation going to the floor now uh, to prohibit the, the possession of big cats by private owners. Coming out of the same Natural Resources Committee, a bill to ban shark finning in the United States. You know, what a difference it makes to uh, change the leadership of the House of Representatives. We've, we've had, now I don't, I don't want to sound hopelessly partisan here. Um, I'm a Democrat. I'm pleased our team is in charge. I work very hard for our legislation to be supported on a bipartisan basis. And I've worked to get Republicans in the Animal Protection Caucus and fight to make sure our bills have balanced <laughs> sponsorship. But as a practical matter, having our team in charge has made it easier to get these bills to the floor. Um, we're, uh, we're seeing a pretty aggressive bipartisan agenda that we're advancing. Uh, another one that is moving uh, legislation to greatly limit the ability of and I don't even like to call them sport hunters, uh, to import trophies of species that have been proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, these things are moving forward. We have 153 members of the Congressional Animal Protection Caucus. I just found out by phone this morning about another prospect, a Republican elected from Texas. <laughs> in a very tough district, but who has evidenced a, his support for animal welfare. And Monday night, I'm going to sign him up when we go back into session. But it's not just the caucus that's moved. It's not just the change in leadership that has permitted us to move legislation forward. I mean, it's been uh, more than frustrating. Uh, when we were dealing with uh, fighting for legislation to prevent the barbaric 
uh, horse soaring, uh, wounding horses, so they have that distinctive gait. We had almost 300 co-sponsors, and the Republican leadership wouldn't allow us to vote on it. Well, we had 300 co-sponsors this time, and it's gone to the floor, and it's passed. But there... But there's greater awareness that these issues that we are talking about have significance that a lot of people just don't think about. Uh, one and a half billion dairy cows and beef cattle, most of whom are treated abysmally. But not only is it wrong, I think, morally, uh, those billion and a half animals produce more carbon emissions than the European Union. If all of those creatures were one country, they would be the third largest emitter behind only China and the United States. So getting these policies right is part of what we need to do to save the planet. If you are one of those benighted souls who believes the scientists and that, you know, we've got 10 years to turn this around. We had um, Greta Thornburg holding court in Congress two weeks ago. Um, amazing the presence that she had after a day of testifying on Capitol Hill. Uh, she joined us for, uh, for a, a reception. We, I had to have it in the Ways and Means Committee Room, the largest room we could find, and it was filled, filled with not just the young staffers, not just advocates. We had members of Congress who were sitting listening, not on camera and fighting for the microphone. An amazing, an amazing time. People are aware of what we are doing to the natural environment and to this, the notion that we could see the near collapse of the insect population over the course of the next decade and what that would mean, again, for life as we know it. We're looking at uh, maybe 40% of all insects disappearing in the course of a few decades. Three billion birds gone missing. I mean, these are items that have profound effect on the natural environment, on human health, on the air we breathe, the water we drink, and our nutrition. And the reference to animal testing. I think we're turning the corner there, and it's kind of exciting. Many of you know last month the Environmental Protection Agency, and every time I hear those words and think of this administration, I cringe. I cringe. You know, I fear for the sage grouse. I fear for what they're doing to environmental standards. But they've announced efforts to phase out much animal testing for mammals by 2035. And if this administration can set that aspirational goal, think what can happen when we return to normal. <laughs> We're nudging the EPA to move faster. We've secured appropriations language, requiring them to look at alternatives, as well as language in the Toxic Substances Control Act amendments to reduce and replace animal testing with alternative methods. Um, and there's not, it's not without controversy, but as I say, I think we've turned the corner. People understood that this should be absolutely the last resort, not the first thing people turn to. I personally welcome the EPA's decision, but I hope that we continue to ratchet up the pressure, to look for alternative, and to expand those efforts. Our challenge is to make the connections, broaden the challenge, 
and involve more people. And you are all on the front lines. I've been working on these issues throughout my tenure in Congress. Um, and it's amazing what's happened, right, Kathy? Can you believe it? I mean, this momentum that is building, the public awareness, the work that is being done in state after state, when we've been unable, unable because of some sad congressional leadership blocking our initiatives, look at what's happened at the state level in terms of animal confinement. Look what's happened at the state level from everything from dove hunting. I, my favorite, I think my favorite of these initiatives is the effort that the Oklahoma Farm Bill, a Farm Bureau advanced. A couple years ago, they had a freedom to farm bill. On the ballot in Oklahoma, 2016, a state that Donald Trump got his second highest vote total. And the animal welfare advocates, the environmentalists, people who cared about consumer protection and health, beat the Oklahoma Farm Bureau 60-40 in Oklahoma. <laughs> we are turning a corner, and you are helping make that turn. We're facing alarming existential crises, dealing with climate, what's happening to our natural resources, what's happening to water with estuary, habitat. It's an existential crisis that will impose immense cruelty on all animals, including humans. But I think the work that you are helping to spearhead, dealing with animal welfare, broadening public awareness on things dealing with food production, water quality, safety, health, and the climate crisis. Um, you know and are spreading the word that animal cruelty is linked to domestic abuse and criminal behavior. Uh, the speed of a meat production line is not just inhumane to workers and to animals, but it's a threat to the consumer. And the power the power of animal welfare at the ballot box. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you're doing. I look forward to being your ally in Congress. And when you have exciting initiatives at the state and local level, maybe I can join you in campaigning on the ground, because this is the change that we can believe in. Thank you very much.